And I wanted to show with some of the Carolina bays. The bays are, they're exclusive to a particular type of landscape. The unconsolidated sandy sed sediments of the coastal plain region. Because the others were too hot? They did, yes. As you move up out of the coastal plain into the, like, the higher, like up into the Piedmont, where we're at, the ground gets rocky and it gets harder. But you've got, it'd be like, imagine that you've got a layer of hard-packed red clay, and then over here you've got a sandy beach. Now let's say I come in with a blast of compressed air, and I blow it on the hard-packed clay, it's not going to do much. I blow it on the sandy surface, and it leaves a, a rounded hole. Yeah. And actually, and you'll be able to see here in a second, I'm almost there. Have you seen the pictures of the bays? Oh, good. Well then, let's take a look. Before we look at the bays, let's look at some regular craters. And here is an example of an elliptical crater. Uh, right there, that elliptical crater, as it says here, uh, the elliptical shape indicates an oblique impact. By an oblique impact, I mean an impact that comes in at a low angle. If it's coming in at a steep angle, it creates a circle. But if it comes in at a low angle, you see it creates an ellipse rather than a circle. And that's what we're looking at. See, here's a normal crater. Kind of like it's skimming the surface. Almost, yes, exactly. Now here's something else that when we look at craters, remember now, craters are important because craters are the clue to what, what, means, what means crater? The grail, yes, crater. Okay, look at these two craters. Now, if you look at those, which one was formed first, this one or this one? This one was formed first, wasn't it? And, and how do you, what makes you conclude that? The overlap, right, exactly. This rim here breaches this rim. Now, in the early days, that was what some of the, the celestial camp was saying. Look, how do you explain in the Carolina Bays when you have overlapping rims? without invoking an impact. Where do we see overlapping rims? Well, in crater phenomena. And here we can see, like here's another, here, a crater, say, within a crater. That's another thing that we see duplicated in the Carolina Bays. Um, this was a, okay, here we go. So here's our bays, and while we're here, let me zoom in for a second. Well, take a look here. Take a look at the, look at the configuration of the Great Lakes. And I'm going to bring in some information about the Great Lakes that I think really supports the conclusion that they were created as a result of a great catastrophe. Because there are scours on the bottom, particularly Lake Superior, gouges that are, you know, 800 feet deep and 20 miles long. And that's not going to get there by normal glacial processes or melting processes. But you'll notice something, again, they all tend to radiate outwards from a central area right around here. Now the ice was down here. I would suggest the possibility that one of the, one of the main strike zones would have been right in here, perhaps right over this area. And it caused tremendous amounts of water to gush out radially from the strike zone and carving the channel that is now occupied lake, by Lake Michigan, carving the channel that is now occupied by Lake Huron, because there was a huge meltwater stream that came down this way. You'd almost think that there was a <coughs> between the, the top water. Okay, so here we're looking at the region of the Carolina Bays, and when we talk about the coastal plain region, it's this dark strip right here. That's the coastal plain, and this is where they're found all along in this area. And as you get into the upper higher layer, higher levels, the ground gets a lot rockier and harder, and they disappear. In fact, there are what I, what I refer to as ghost bays, ghost Carolina bays, as you get into the Piedmont region. This is what a, a typical bay looks like from the interior. It's just a low, swampy, full of snakes and... Uh, we're not going to read the quotes, we're just going to look at the pictures. 
And this was the thing that first, actually it was the, uh, in 1930, Myrtle Beach Estates, in order to facilitate the sale of the timber from some of its extensive land holdings in Horry County, South Carolina, had engaged Fairchild Surveys Incorporated to photograph from the air some 500 square miles in the Myrtle Beach area. When the photo runs had been flown and the prints developed, a Fairchild engineer in the company's New York office, Edwin H. Corlett, noted the presence of numerous mystifying elliptical features, some small, some very large, all possessing such an amazing geometrical perfection that they seemed artificial particularly some that seemed to be marching in rank across the wooded plain headed towards the ocean strand. Are there any in Louisiana? Mel Louisiana? There might be. I don't know if there's some, there's some, some, some things have shown up in Texas that have a lot of the characteristics of, of Carolina bays. Um, I don't know about Louisiana, but maybe. The problem there is, is that Louisiana was, you know, half, the southern half of Louisiana was all pretty much built as a giant delta during the big floods coming down the Mississippi. So if the Carolina Bays precipitated the floods, that drainage of the whole Mississippi Basin down there could have pretty much eliminated them. Melton and Shriver were the first two geologists that investigated the bays, and they said that a careful study of those, those photographs showed that the origin of these bays involved problems of extraordinary interest. And this is a reproduction of the aerial mosaic that Edwin H. Corlett put together in the New York office back in 1930. And it was, you can see on here, this is what he is seeing. And there are dozens of them on this, photo, on this mosaic. All of these lines, of course, this is like probably a hundred different photographs all laid out together on a big table. But there you can see not only the elliptical shape, but the fact that the ellipses are all pretty much aligned parallel with one another. Okay, so here is a geological topo map, and you look in there, and you can see that there are how many bays there are, and some of them have lakes, and others, you know, the, there's now a lake in it, but the lake, the, 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 bay, the original bay is filling up with peat. And probably in another thousand years, that will not exist as a lake anymore. It will just be a swampy, peaty area. Okay. Were they all dated? Well, that's part of the controversy. That's part of the controversy. The, there have been attempts to date them that have been controversial. But interestingly, in most of the excavations that have been done, in the radiocarbon dating usually dates between eight and 12,000 years. 8, 8 and 13, 8 and 14, something like that. But you got to remember, if these things were produced by gradualistic processes, the dating would be pretty straightforward. If they're produced by catastrophic forces, particularly the kind we're invoking here, which is like multi-megaton explosions, you're going to have such a huge redistribution of material that you're going to have older organic and younger organic material all mixed together. Then you're also going to have the possibility of a carbon-14 enhancement, okay, wit, here's where you can see the parallelism of the bays and also the more prominent ridges on the south and eastern sides as compared with the north and western sides. That'll show up, yeah, there shows the parallel axes of the bays. I wouldn't think the organic stuff would be worth anything as far as carbon dating and all. Well, what, what, you, yeah, what you have to do, there's, there's, once you get through the sediment, there's a layer on the bottom of, they call it a baked sand, and it's given a name humate. And if you go down to the bottom of the bays and basically take a large enough statistical sampling, I think you could get an idea of the, of the ages because you are going to have redistribution of all, some older material. But if you assume that most of the peat began to form, subsequent to the creation of the shallow depression, then the oldest radiocarbon dates should roughly coincide with the date of formation of the hole in the ground. Be just like if Sam went out here in his yard and dug a big hole in the ground 
and went away and left it. We came back in a thousand years and it filled up with stuff. Well, if we start sampling it, obviously the dates should get older as we get towards the bottom. And then as we get to the bottom layer, that should be a date that's getting fairly close to the date that Sam actually dug the hole. How deep was the ocean where these bays are? Well, this was, a, this was not in the ocean. This was on the coastal plain. So at the time, if we assume these bays were produced 13,000 years ago, the ocean was 400 feet lower than it now is. So it's possible, that raises the possibility that before the sea level raise, when the coastal, much, when another 40 or 50 or 100 miles of the coastal plain was exposed, there may have been thousands of bays on there too, but they're now under the ocean and the rising of the ocean would have erased them and filled them in and washed them away, so we don't know. But here as it says here, note the peat bog encroaching upon the lake and the small bay on the northwest. And that length there is one and two-thirds miles. Is the peat the dark one? No, that's the lake. That's the water. That's the water. Where's the peat coming from? Well, it's because plants are growing in there. Yeah. And then they, they die and they fall in and then they form this accumulation of, you know, partially decomposed organic matter <clears throat> that accumulates. And you can see here, here's one, and you can still see the ellipticity of it. You can also see what appears to be almost like multiple rims on the southeastern side. And here's, here you can very clearly see the greater rim and higher, thicker rim of material here than around the rest of the bay, which again, the early scientists that looked at it who were in favor of a comet strike theory said, well, if a comet came in from the northwest, wouldn't it be logical that a lot of the material would be pushed out to the southeast? And here it is. There it is. And of course, the, the terrestrial group, the gradualist group, they didn't really have an explanation for that. So they didn't talk about it too much. Here's another mosaic showing the concentration of these things. And here, look. Oh, see there? Look, there's like a crater inside a crater, just like we saw on the moon. Now here's what I'm calling ghost bays. And you see this, as you get up off the coastal plain, the soft material, and you transition up onto the Piedmont, what happens is the bays go from being very well defined to just being almost like ghost-like shadows. But you can see a ghost bay, you know, like here's one right here. See? And, and then as you go a little further, they disappear completely. And when I first started studying the bays, my thought was, well, anybody who's looked at them, even the geologists in the 30s and 40s and 50s who believed it was a comet strike, in all of their discussions, the assumption was that the comet strike itself was limited to the coastal plain. Well, I'm thinking, just like we were, I just was talking about, they may have been out in the ocean, but of course we have no evidence. Well, what if they were continued and there was actually more of them than the 500,000 that have now been counted along the coastal plain from Virginia to Florida. And, but we just don't see them. And the other assumption was is that the... How many did you say? 500,000. Yes. Huh? Yes. Good well, okay, so here's how my thinking went. And I want you to follow this, follow this thinking. Here's the distribution of them. Uh, if you look at the speckled area, Here's uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And you can see there's a thick cluster of them in here. This is the Cape Fear River area. Then they thin out, but there's still thousands of them all in here. They come up here. Here's a cluster of them up here. They don't show any of the Virginia craters because when this was done in 1952, they hadn't discovered. There's actually, I think, the most northern Carolina bay that's now been discovered is in New Jersey. And then, like I said to you, Maria, there's this cluster of things in Texas that has lot of similar features that make them look like they could be, you know, formed as the consequence of the same event. Okay, and then you'll see like uh, there's a cluster of them right in here in Georgia. There's a cluster of them down here. The ones that Jeremy and I flew over were this cluster down here. There was a little airport there and we just drove up and found some guy and gave him, I don't know, 50, 70 bucks. And he flew us up for a couple hours. 
Right up in here, they, there's none of them above the fall line. You won't find any of them north of Macon. The first bays that you find in, in Georgia, there's a cluster right here just south of Macon. And it's those bays that Ed Alban came across because the, the, the Eocene Oligocene exposure, the 35 million year old exposure where the tectites are found, is right down in here in the transition from the Piedmont to the, to the coastal plain. So he'd been down there looking for tectites when he came across the cluster of small bays right in here and started going, what are these things? So Ed, you know, it was, it was probably the first mainstream scientist that I know of that, that endorsed the idea that these things were probably created by a cosmic strike rather than some, you know, sinkhole process. Yeah. How did the Olympical align with the lakes? Which lakes? Great lakes. Well, as it turns out, here's the interesting thing. As you move from north to south, what you discover is the orientation of the ellipses changes. So that when you're up here in this area, they're like this, but when you get in southern Georgia, they're more north-south. And also, the eccentricity of the, uh, the geometry of the ellipse changes. So that, you know, when you're talking about an ellipse, the eccentricity is the measure of its flattening. It, so a, a, an ellipse with zero eccentricity is a circle, right? So as you get into the Georgia bays, and I'm going to show you pictures of them here, they get more circular, and the axis changes. And if you study the, 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 the alignments carefully, what it appears is if actually they were produced by a multiple fragmentation event, where you had a first fragmentation that created several larger pieces that then subsequently went, underwent several successive stages of fragmentation as they spread out at different angles. But the ones up here, if you plot those lines, they pass directly over the Great Lakes. So, um, In other words, you could say that probably they occurred over a four, five, six hour period then. That might be about... The, just like the uh, Shoemaker Levy going into uh, Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, that took about, what was it, four hours, I think, for that whole thing to happen. Well, it actually took several days for all 21 pieces yeah. to arrive. Yeah, but the whole breakup, that could, that could happen. Oh, yeah, I mean, this, this could be something that happens, you know, yeah, in less than a day. Yeah. In four to six hours, that could be a very realistic yeah. amount of time. All right, look here, here's the plotting of several of the of the alignments. And you can see here that there are several sets of alignments. The main alignments from the main clusters pass right over the Great Lakes. And then of course if you keep following that pathway, let's assume that this was an event that happened 13,000 years ago. Well if the object is coming in from the northwest along, and this represents a flight path more or less, it's going to carry it right over the ice sheet, isn't it? Right. So that was my thinking. So this, we're, we're going back here to like probably 88, 89, right in there when I first started really looking into the Carolina Bays. And that was my thinking. And I thought, okay, is there any evidence of anything unusual related to, the, to the, what happened to the ice? That was my question in my mind. Is there any, if I go and I search in the literature and learn about the melting of the ice or the deglaciation, is there anything unusual that be, could be consistent? And of course, I had no idea what I was getting myself into at that point. I mean, it's led to, you know, what, 18 excursions now to out west tracking the evidence for this event. And yes, then of course I discovered the Missoula flood. And then two and two went together and I thought, you know what, I heard about that Missoula flood. I read a reference to it in a book called um, Quest for Atlantis by Cedric Lannard actually a very good book written in the mid-1970s and he has a chapter in there entitled The Catastrophe of 10,000 BC and that was really one of the early expositions of what we've been talking about here and he made reference to the, the, the Missoula flood in there but of course he pretty much proposed the, the standard line which that it was formed by this great lake bursting through an ice dam so I thought, well, okay, is there another pot? Could it be, this was my first thought, could it be that the bursting of the ice dam 
was triggered by an impact or the passage of an object. That was my first line of thought. And the more I went into that, the more I began to think, no, that can't be the case. Because I began finding the evidence for massive flood flows outside the pathway of the draining lake. To me, that was a clincher that, OK, there were other sources of flood water. That became apparent very early on. So what it began to appear like was that you had a general large-scale melting event. And then as I began to read back into the literature and I read J. Harlan Bretz's early papers, that's what he was proposing, a large-scale melting event. But all of the critics said, well, <laughs> what you're proposing is ridiculous. There's nothing, you know, there's no volcanoes in the right area. The climate change that you're talking about, the sudden warming of the climate, we know stuff like that doesn't happen. And because of that, there was no flood. That's what the critics, that's how the critics handled Bretz's work from the 1920s to the 1940s and 50s. But see, in the 1980s, I was connecting the Carolina Bays with the Missoula flood. And it wasn't until 1998 that me and Brad finally got out there and began to research it for ourselves in the field. And it was 99 when we went out and went to British Columbia and went up the uh, Fraser River Valley and the Okanagan River Valley and up the headwaters of the Columbia and up the Rocky Mountain Trench. And everywhere we went, we found evidence of large-scale mega flows flowing south out of the Canadian Rockies. And three weeks before we left on that trip, with one of our destinations being the o Lake Okanagan and Okanagan Valley, a team of Canadian geologists published a paper entitled Back to Bretts. And in that paper, these Canadian geologists led by John Shaw said, we have found evidence in the Okanagan Valley that there was a large-scale melting and a flow southward. Well, if you look at a map, a flow southward out of the Okanagan Valley takes it right out across the Channel Scablands and the Basalt Plateau. So that, for me, was a major confirmation that we were on the right track. So while Geology Magazine of that July, I believe it was, had that as a feature article, Brad and I were out there scouring those river valleys finding evidence that there had been gigantic flows, you know, massive flows coming out of those valleys, which again led to the conclusion there had to have been some kind of a melting event. What could it be? Well, what led to that conclusion in the first place was the theory that the Carolina Bays would have been produced by a swarm coming in of cosmic material or one object breaking up. Of course, I've got another theory now that I haven't accepted, but I'm considering it. If you had a major impact in the region of the Great Lakes, is it possible in a normal impact you have what's called fallback breccia, the broken material that goes up and then comes down. They know that a lot of the secondary fires associated with the KT boundary 65 million years ago that Wendy Wolbach studied were caused by the fallback breccia, falling back to earth and igniting secondary fires. <coughs> Well, here's another possibility, and I'm not sure yet how you would go about testing this theory. But is it possible that the Carolina Bays are actually where fallback breccia in the form of large chunks of ice fell? Were you thinking that? Up until this point, the theory, and I'm still inclined towards the theory that they are deflation hollows. By that, I mean an aerial burst creates such a pressure wave that essentially I use the analogy of a blast of compressed air. I'm still, gonna, I'm still inclined towards that theory, that it was a Tunguska type explosion, atmospheric explosion. The pressure wave striking the ground was so intense that it just scooped out these hollows. Then they were later perhaps, even like the gradualists are saying, they could have been modified by more uniform processes. But Somewhere a few years ago, I started thinking, is it possible that large ice chunks could survive a passage through the atmosphere and actually fall back down, thousands of them? And in the melting off, you've got sheet floods going across the coastal plain leading to the ocean. Here's, a, here's an interesting digital relief map that was done a few years ago where you can really see the relief of the bays. Look at this. There's many examples. Look at the overlapping rims. Now, 
when we look at craters like on the moon or Mars, an overlapping rim might imply that clearly that, that one was formed earlier, but it also might imply that they were separated by thousands or even millions of years. But given that these Carolina Bays will probably not exist in another 10, certainly not in 100,000 years, <clears throat> you could still get the same effect even if the secondary impacts were literally seconds or minutes after the first one. And there's a map of Lake Waccamaw. This is the largest Carolina Bay known. Lake Waccamaw takes its name from the Waccamaw tribe, the Indians that inhabited the area. Is that about seven miles? Seven miles along the long axis, that's right. Here's a series. Now you can see this is pretty much filled in. There's no lake here. But look, this is the southeast up here. And can you see the sand rim? This, this is not looking... You know, in other words, this is just taken from the air, and this is from the, that's the southeast is up there. Here's another one. This is, the, this is the east and the south right here. So again, you see that most of them have these prominent sand rib, rims, either on the east or the south, which again suggests something blowing material out from the north, or from the northwest. And here we see... <coughs> As we transition from the coastal plain to the Piedmont, you see the ghost, ghostly like they're they're more just almost like shadowy imprints on the landscape. Oh, sort of. You see it there, and here's one here. And here you'll see some. Uh, let's see. Okay, that circle down there near Valdosta is where. That's where we were, right? Yeah, because we were down there near Adel or Adel Adele. or whatever. Adele? Yeah, it's Adele. Adele, okay. Um, there it is, Adele, right there. And you can see they show up on the map. And some of the bays, you know, there's the swamps, you can only find parts of the ellipse, the original ellipse. But look, there's some down here. You can see them. Look, one there's right there, a small one, but still maintains its ellipticity. Is Okefenokee looks like a skull? Is Okefenokee uh, No, but the Okefenokee may be an earlier, much older, actually, because there is a bay, shallow circular basin under the Okefenokee. All right, so here's, like, look at these, Carol, like, here's a Georgia Bay, and you'll notice how its axis is almost north-south, and it's also squatter. The ellipse isn't quite as elegant in the Georgia Bays. But these are all in southern Georgia. And here you can see the topo maps that they show up on. Like Guest Mill Pond is a fairly well-defined bay. Um, Would that mean that the objects that fell were round? Not necessarily, no. Because... They make a, a jagged shape and they were... No, Rosie, no, because you got to bear in mind, these things are possibly moving at 20 or 30,000 miles per hour and they're probably exploding in the atmosphere. So you're not actually talking about solid objects hitting the ground. Okay, here's a photograph of one of the Georgia bays. And actually, you can see, I mean, it's crater-like form is pretty apparent. Why don't they build on it? Is it too mushy? Uh, I mean, it's like the whole area is around it. Most of it's farming. Yeah, most of it's farming. You, you don't want to, I mean, that soft peat, you can't put any serious mushy. sized buildings on it. It's like putting it on mush. So this is in 1977. In, in, in the 1960s, in the 1960s, up until the 1960s, nobody had gone in and actually explored the bottom of a Carolina Bay. Now, according to Douglas Johnson, the big shot, remember him? He said that they were formed by artesian springs welling up from below that were following the tilt of the limestone bedrock. And when they got to a hole or an aperture in the bedrock, an, you know, an artesian spring is moving underwater, under, it's a perched water table under a, an impervious cap rock. It finds an aperture, and under pressure, it forms an upside-down waterfall. This was his theory, the complex theory. 
This was the artesian part of it. Then it forms an upside down waterfall like this, and then just like a waterfall will eat its rim back, forming a cataract, it eats a slot up tilt, and as it does this, up above it's forming an elliptical sinkhole. Now, the sinkhole fills with a lake. That's the lacustrine part. Then prevailing winds throughout the Ice Age that he presumed came from the southwest, I believe, blow on the lake and cause the waves to circulate around and smooth it out into this nice ellipse. That was the theory. And everybody said, geez, the complex theory, artesian solution, lacustrine aeolian hypothesis, well, anything that complex must be right. So they forgot, they, the controversy went to sleep. This is the early 50s. By the 1960s, they've been going in and they've been taking bottom samples. And they've been going down, they've been finding this humate, this, the baked sand layer, and guess what? There's nothing to indicate any kind of a slot or an aperture or a fissure or anything in the bottoms of any of the bays that they looked at. So right there, that completely disproved Douglas Johnson's hy complex hypothesis. Well, interestingly, nobody seemed to notice that suddenly the whole argument of the tr gradualist camp just completely got blown off the table. Well, about 10, 20, 10 years go by, 15 years go by, 1977 now, and you have this guy, Raymond Koksarowski, who's going... Who, who knew enough about it to go, wait a second, Douglas Johnson's theory has just been disposed of. Well, if you dispose of the main contending theory that was used to rebut the cosmic impact strike theory, suddenly he began to fear that the danger of the cosmic strike theory being revitalized. So what he did was devised a new theory published a new tome with the same title as Douglas Johnson's book in which he presented his theory of the formation of the Carolina Bays. What he, what he succeeded in doing by publishing that was again <coughs> prevent the debate from happening for another 20 years. See what, what Cox Orowski said. This is what he said in 1977. Investigations of oriented lakes and bays in different geographic areas have shown that the process that initially produced them apparently differ. Up to this point, he says, um, surprisingly, let's see, theories that have been proposed for the origin of the bays are numerous and diverse. Surprisingly, however, most workers seem to have neglected the concept of uniformitarianism in their studies of these remarkable features. Hence, few investigations have been designed to compare or contrast the Carolina Bays with modern analogs in Alaska, Chile, and Texas. Now here's, he's doing a little sleight of hand here that, that a non-scientist is going to probably completely miss. See why I've got modern analogs underlined? Modern analogs, and he's citing modern analogs in Alaska, Chile, and Texas. Well, I mentioned the Texas. This is what he's referring to here, because some of these basins in Texas had just come to light in the 70s. So here's what he's doing. He's saying modern analogs, and the, co the celestial camp said this. We don't find Carolina Bays being formed anywhere on Earth today. If they're being formed by gradualistic processes, that are more or less just extrapolations of common modern processes, shouldn't we see somewhere in the world formations underway that are going to end up as Carolina Bays? That was their argument. Well, so then what he does is he brings up what he calls modern analogs in Alaska, Chile, and Texas and says, look, there are things like that forming in Alaska and Chile and Texas. Okay, again. Unless you look a little further, you might be deceived by this because when you go in and start looking at the studies that have been done in Alaska, Chile, and Texas, let's take a look at the Alaska ones for a second. Well, when you go in and you begin to study the literature of Alaska, and there's only been a few papers written on it, guess what they say? Because see, as it turns out, okay, here's, here's let's, let's look at this graph before we go on. So this is what I started thinking back in the late 80s, early 90s, Carolina Bay's down here. 
if they were produced by something coming in from the northwest, it would have clearly carried it right over the ice sheet. So I thought, well, is there evidence of anything unusual happening to the ice sheet at the end of the last ice age? Is there anything unusual in the region on the other side of the ice sheet? Like up in this area along the coastal plain of North, A North Alaska. Well, look at what happens when we go right up here to the coastal plain of Alaska. What do we find? There they are the oriented lakes that have been compared to Carolina bays. Look at these. And of course, they're much longer and skinnier. So they're going faster? Or? Well, they're coming, they're at an even lower angle. Something okay. coming in at a low angle. So they're really skinny. And yeah, these could be very close to almost skipping. But also because they're at the top of the planet, couldn't it be the less gravitational or something? No, no, because the gravitation is going to be an effect of the total mass of the planet acting from a mathematical point at the planet's center of gravity. And give us the equation for that, would you please? I could do that later. Okay, so, as it turns out, when you cross the ice sheet right on the other side, you find what is considered to be the closest modern analog to the Carolina Bays. However, when you then go into the studies of the Alaskan Oriented Lakes, what do you discover? They're 13,000 years old. So see this, see the, the ruse this guy is pulling here? They're not modern analogs at all. See? So then he goes on and he says, um, this is interesting because this is Okay, so his next, investigation of oriented lakes and bays in these different geographic areas have shown that the processes that initially produce them apparently differ. However, absolutely no evidence has been encountered that would support an extraterrestrial origin. Incipient oriented lakes develop in top, topographic depressions created by coastal fluvial aeolian solutioning, glacial, periglacial, and perhaps some tectonic processes. What did it leave out? A lot of drugs. That was a man. He didn't leave out much. Maybe, maybe, you know, cow flatulence. He left that out. But he probably should have included that. <laughs> Transport my way back. Yeah, in all cases, oriented lake development has occurred in unconsolidated sediments easily transported by wave action. But get this. What do I have underlined? develop in topographic depressions. Hmm, well how convenient that the whole process starts after the topographic depressions are already there. You see what he's doing? He's ignoring the fundamental part of the whole process. How the hell did the topographic depressions get there for all of these other things to then go to work on? That he conveniently ignores. So he says few known impact craters on Earth or other planets could be classified as being elliptical due to the fact that meteorites are generally believed to explode on impact producing a spherical rather than an elliptical crater. If one therefore assumes that these craters are not spherical because the meteorites did not explode on impact, the logical conclusion would be that at least some meteorites would remain. However, no meteorite material has ever been discovered in association with any bays. Well, first of all, in 1977, nobody had ever looked for it. Secondly, we also know from Tunguska that there's no meteorite. The only thing we found in association with Tunguska is microspherals that show up under a microscope. So now, this guy is assuming that all craters have to be round and that they only are formed by a direct explosion of something striking and penetrating into the ground and then exploding. That don't happen in a rounded, in an object that's turning. Well, in retrospect, this is what he says. It is rather unfortunate that the meteorite theory ever made its way into the literature since many laymen, <laughs> get this, even a number of geologists still subscribe to it in spite of the fact that no concrete supported evidence whatsoever exists. So to, to demonstrate how uh, 
he, okay, this is what his did. Vertical view of Koksarowski's model experiment using unconsolidated sand in conjunction with high speed, fa speed fans. Dimensions of the trough are 2 meters by 2 meters by 10 centimeters. So here's what he did. <laughs> he took this tray and he spread sand in it. And then he scooped out a hollow. Then he took a high-speed fan and blew across the tray of sand where he had scooped out by hand a hollow. And then it produced this shape, which, as far as I'm looking at it, to me that looks like more like a football than a Carolina Bay. I know, but the thing is, is he just proved, he just disproved what he said. Well, in a way he did, yeah. By See, scooping out the hollow, he disproved Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you go through his logic, his logic really breaks down. This is the kind of stuff we need to look for, though. Um, near Camden, South Carolina, is a long farm drainage ditch with a depth of about 14 feet. Exposed at the bottom of the ditch are masses of prostrate timbers. Where do we see prostrate timbers? Absolutely. Many of considerable size, indicating a massive blowdown. If those logs show a carbon-14 date corresponding to the birth of the bays, we would have a dramatic curtain raising on a day of disaster like no other in the history of man. That was written in 1982 in a book I would highly recommend to everybody in here, uh, The Mysterious Carolina Bays by Henry Savage. And what really clinched uh, for me what this was, you remember Lake Waccamaw? Yeah. Okay, and we'll end with Lake Waccamaw, and then we'll get off the bays for now. In Lake Waccamaw, named after the Indian tribe, the Waccamaw tribe, that inhabited that region prior to the arrival of Columbus, right? So the biggest Carolina Bay bears the name of the Indian tribe. So being somebody who's always interested in indigenous accounts and myths and legends and so forth, I thought, what about native or indigenous peoples that lived in this region? Do they have anything to say about it? So I began to do some research, and I discovered, well, the most prevalent tribe in the area was the Waccamaw tribe. So I decided I would look up and find out, see what I could find out about the Waccamaw tribe. And here is what I found. Their very name means the people of the falling star. And this is their tribal logo right here. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's exa And I thought, yeah, I'm going to trust these people more than I am Raymond Koksarowski.